come back to the issue of chronology, uh, time scales, but I want to think about this subject from a, from a geological perspective. One of the big differences between the creationist and the evolutionary viewpoints concerns the age of the earth. Biblical creationists believe that God created the world in six days, about 6,000 years ago, and that stands in stark contrast to the evolutionary viewpoint which says that the Earth originated about four and a half billion years ago. And what this means is that as creationists we face something that we might call the plausibility problem. Uh, because the old Earth perspective is so ingrained not only in the scientific community, but in our wider culture, it seems absurd to most people to even consider challenging the idea of an Earth that is millions or billions of years old. Uh, what I want to do in this talk is to suggest an approach that might help us to get over the plausibility problem. And in order to do this, I want to focus on the Earth's sedimentary rock record, uh, because the, the sedimentary rock record is considered by many to be the primary evidence uh, favouring the old Earth perspective. And I want to present an argument to you that the young Earth model actually makes better sense of the major features of the Earth's sedimentary rock record than the old Earth model. Now we know that the Earth's continents uh, are covered with fossil bearing sedimentary rock averaging about one and a half to two thousand metres thick and we know that these sedimentary rocks uh, originated as layers of usually water deposited sediments that were compacted and cemented to form sedimentary rocks. But the question we need to uh, address today is how quickly were these sediments deposited? Were they laid down uh, in a one year flood and its aftermath as I think we can infer from the Bible or were they deposited over hundreds of millions of years as indicated by radiometric dating. And we need to say a word or two here about radiometric dating techniques because these are the techniques that are used by conventional geologists to assign ages of millions or billions of years to the Earth's rocks and minerals. Uh, radioactive dating uses the decay of naturally occurring radioactive isotopes as a kind of clock from which we uh, derive an age and it can be applied to uh, igneous rocks primarily, uh, such as lava flows and volcanic ash deposits, which are interbedded with the sedimentary rock layers. And I think we have to acknowledge that these radiometric dates have a kind of inherent plausibility. Uh, they give us actual numbers, uh, and those numbers have error bars attached to them. So that has, has a kind of air of precision about it. And what's more, radiometric dates typically reflect the relative age of rock units as established on the basis of other kinds of geological evidence. So you can see here uh, a cross-section, if you like, through the rocks of Grand Canyon in Arizona, and you can see the ages that have been established on the basis of rubidium strontium, one, one of the radiometric dating systems, and those ages reflect the relative order in which we know those rock formations uh, were formed on the basis of other uh, geological evidence like the relationships of the, the rock layers and so on. So if we want to maintain the creationist position we need to address the challenges that are presented by radiometric dating. How do we do that? Well one approach uh, that's been popular among creationists has been to challenge the assumptions underlying radiometric dating methods. For example, questioning the initial conditions, or the constancy of decay rates, or the contamination of the samples that are being dated. And if you want to explore some of those questions further, there's a very good book. Uh, I've got a copy on the book table. I think AIG have some uh, other copies. Uh, called Thousands Not Billions by Dr. Don DeYoung, and I'd, I'd recommend uh, getting a copy of that if you're interested in those questions. But another way to challenge radiometric dating is to ask whether the radiometric dates actually make sense when we compare them to other types of geological evidence. And that's what I want to do in the talk this afternoon. And I want to begin by thinking about sediment accumulation rates. 
There are several ways that we can estimate the rates at which sediments are being laid down today in lakes and rivers and oceans. Uh, we can deposit marker materials on the floor of a lake and then come back to see how quickly that marker material has been buried. Or we can use sediment traps of various kinds. And we know from these kinds of studies that modern sedimentation rates vary um, quite a bit, but uh, depending on the particular environment that you're studying. But on average, they, they, they turn out around one centimetre per year. That's an average modern sedimentation rate, one centimetre per year. I want you to remember that number. Remember one centimetre per year. That's the modern sedimentation rate. What about sedimentation rates in the Earth's distant past? Now, obviously, uh, we can't directly measure them because we weren't there. So we have to rely on indirect methods to estimate sedimentation rates in the Earth's past. And one of the methods that we can use is to apply radiometric dating. And it works something like this. Uh, here we have a stack of sedimentary rock layers uh, and you can see that uh, in this stack of layers there are two volcanic ash layers. Uh, one at the bottom and one near the top. Uh, now we can't date the sedimentary rocks directly using radiometric dating but we can date the volcanic ash layers and in this um, example the lowermost ash layer has a radiometric age of 545 million years the uppermost ash layer has uh, an age of 495 million years. So there's a 50 million year difference between those two radiometric ages. So we, uh, we conclude that um, the rocks in between those two volcanic ash layers represent 50 million years of sedimentary deposition. And we can measure the thickness of those sediments. We see that there are 500 meters of sediment for the purposes of this argument I'm going to ignore the compaction of sediments. Um, that kind of complicates things a bit, but it actually doesn't have any material and doesn't make a material difference to the argument. So we have 500 meters of sediment in 50 million years. So you can work out an average sedimentation rate, right? So uh, it turns out that in this example, the uh, average sedimentation rate must have been about 0 0.001 centimeter per year. Now, again, when we uh, look at uh, estimates of ancient sedimentation rates based on radiometric dating, the numbers vary a bit, um, but most often they turn out around uh, the figure that I gave in that example, about 0 0.001 centimetre per year. So if you've been sort of following this so far, you'll have noticed something I hope very, very striking which is that average sedimentation rates estimated using radiometric dates are much, much lower than the average sedimentation rates that we can directly measure in modern day environments. In fact, ancient sedimentation rates based on radiometric dating are lower than modern rates by about three orders of magnitude. That's a 1,000 fold difference. Uh, another way to express this discrepancy is to say that if sedimentation rates in the past were approximately the same as sedimentation rates in the present day, which I think most conventional geologists would assume, then in any local section of rock we ought to see much more sedimentary rock. Uh, most of the rock is actually missing. And this is not a problem which is news to conventional geologists. They're very well aware about the, uh, of, of this particular issue. Um, one of the classic studies was carried out by a geologist, Pete Sadler, who in 1981 compiled nearly 25,000 estimates of sedimentation rates over different time spans, ranging from sedimentation in a single hour during a modern day flash flood, through to estimates of ancient sedimentation rates over time scales of millions of years based on radiometric dating. And he found this orders of magnitude difference, this discrepancy uh, in the measurements. And in fact, the discrepancy gets bigger the longer the time span that we consider, the so-called Sadler effect. So when you read the conventional literature, knowing that geologists are aware of this problem, what is the solution that they present to this problem? 
Well, the solution is to say that the geological record is extremely incomplete. They argue that any particular location on the Earth's surface must have experienced much more sedimentation in the past than the preserved sediments that we can actually see today. So much more sediment was laid down, but uh, because of time gaps in between those sedimentary events, when erosion was happening, most of the sediment got removed in any particular locality. So let's just try to visualise you know, what these geologists are saying. They're proposing that you get episodes of sedimentation and then you have time gaps when much of that sediment is then removed. So imagine we have some sediments deposited and then there's a time gap. And during that time gap, erosion happens and the sediments get stripped away. And then at some point there's some more sediments deposited and then more erosion during another time gap. Uh, and then more sediments are laid down and then more erosion, more sediments laid down, more erosion, and so on. And what you end up with is a composite uh, stratigraphic column, a, a column of rocks at any particular location that is absolutely chock full of time gaps uh, of various durations. Uh, and if this particular view of Earth history is correct, then the sedimentation rates that we've estimated from radiometric dates only appear to be unrealistically low because most of the sediments at any location are in fact now missing. Now how much missing time are we talking about? You know when you look at any local section of rocks how much geological time is represented and how much is actually missing? Well here's what one geologist said Invariably, we find that the rock record requires only a small fraction, usually 1 to 10% of the available time, even if we take into account all possible breaks in the sequence. The universality and especially the magnitude of the shortfall are startling. And that's why I've called my talk 99% missing. Something like 90 to 99% of all geological time is missing from any stack of rocks that you might uh, look at. Now the question I want to ask is, apart from radiometric dating, do we actually have good evidence for all of that missing time? And the answer, it turns out, is actually no. Back in 2012, the Geological Society actually held a meeting on this very subject, and the papers got published in this book strata in time probing the gaps in our understanding. Let me just read you a line or two from the back of this book. Incompleteness is an essential property of the record. That gaps exist at all scales in sedimentary successions is easily demonstrated from consideration of sediment accumulation rates. Okay, so that's what we've been saying so far. Locating and quantifying the gaps in the record is, however, very much less straightforward. That's really interesting, isn't it? They actually, in this book, talk about the time gaps as cryptic. What does cryptic mean? It means hidden. Okay, the time gaps are hidden. You see, what would we expect to see if there really had been long time gaps in between sedimentary episodes? Well, let's think about it. Uh, here we have at the top of this slide um, a series of flat-lying sedimentary layers that are deposited. And then imagine that we have an extended period uh, where there isn't any sediment being deposited and inevitably erosion happens. And erosion we know produces um, uneven topography, it produces gullies and canyons and valleys uh, in that uh, surface. And then we have uh, the resumption of uh, deposition and that old erosion surface gets buried and then perhaps we have a second cycle of uh, sedimentation and erosion and what we end up with is this extremely complex uh, stratigraphy where we have multiple buried erosion surfaces with lots of evidence of time gaps. However, that is not what we typically see in sedimentary rock sequences. What we typically see looks much more like this. 
uh, where we have these flat lying layers and even where we have some evidence of erosion, so here we have some sediments deposited that are not deposited over here, we actually don't find evidence of very deep erosion in many uh, cases. Let me show you an example or two. Here we see the contact between the Moenkopi formation, which is the reddish rock unit um, uh, on the bottom, and then we have <coughs> above it the Shinarump conglomerate, which is the lowermost unit of the Chinle formation. This is in Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. <coughs> now, according to conventional radiometric dates, there's a long time gap uh, between these two successive rock units. In fact, the whole of the middle Triassic and part of the upper Triassic are missing. So uh, that amounts to at least 10 million years and possibly more of missing time between those two rock units. <clears throat> and yet when we examine that contact across um, southern and central Utah and northern Arizona, it is typically flat. <clears throat> There's no evidence of the kind of deep channel erosion uh, that we would expect. In fact, just below the contact, uh, in many places, there are these thin siltstone and mudstone layers, which are very easily eroded layers. How did they survive 10 million years of erosion um, without being stripped away? And in fact, we also have evidence on the underside of the Shinarump conglomerate that the Moenkopi formation was still soft and unconsolidated and saturated with water. Thank you, Andrew. Um, at the time that the Shinarump conglomerate was deposited. Now, all of that evidence suggests that, in fact, the time that passed between the deposition of the Moenkopi and the deposition of the Shinarump was uh, actually rather short. Uh, here's a, a, another uh, example. I've picked out actually three um, time gaps in the sequence of rocks at Grand Canyon in Arizona, and I want you particularly to look at that lowermost contact which is a 100 million year time gap. So we're not talking about 10 million years. This is a 100 million year time gap. Uh, there's a huge span of missing time involved here at that particular uh, location. Now, what kind of erosion would we expect if 100 million years had passed? Well, we can look at average erosion uh, rates in the present day. And based on those average erosion rates, we'd expect you could remove 3,000 meters of rock at modern day erosion rates. The, put that in context, Grand Canyon itself is 1,600 meters deep. So you could, you could er erode a canyon twice the depth of Grand Canyon in 100 million years, and yet that contact is essentially flat. There is a bit of erosion, I've seen it from the river rafting along the Colorado River, there are some channels in that surface, so there's a little bit of missing time, but those channels are no more than 12 to 30 metres uh, deep. You know, you can, you can produce channels that big on a Tuesday afternoon. So, you know, th those, uh, those are not evidence of 100 million years of missing time. Uh, here's a, an even more spectacular example. This is a canyon in, in northern Texas where you've got sedimentary rocks of Pliocene age resting on top of sedimentary rocks of Triassic age. Six entire geological systems are missing at this location. 200 million years of missing time, and yet it's a flat contact. And just to give you one example a bit close to home, this is the north face of Penavan in the Brecon Beacons. Some of you may even have climbed this uh, in South Wales. And the arrow there is pointing to uh, a time gap of 10 million years. You can actually trace that particular contact over hundreds of square miles, and it's very, very flat. So in many places, exactly where we expect to see evidence of the passage of time between sedimentary rock layers, where, where millions of years are meant to have passed, we simply don't see the physical evidence that we'd expect to see. But we haven't quite finished. Because missing erosion isn't the only problem. Another concerns the absence of animal activity. Imagine you have a freshly deposited layer of sediment on the floor of a shallow ocean, maybe deposited during a particular storm or a hurricane. And then there's a time gap before anything else happens. What, what happens to that sedimentary layer? Well, what happens very quickly is that it gets colonized by animals. Animals come in 
and they burrow through the sediments to build their homes or to process the sediment for food. And these uh, activities are extremely effective at mixing up the sediment, churning up the sediment and destroying any internal structures uh, within the sedimentary layers. Uh, we call this sediment churning by animals biotubation, biotubation. And the oceans teem with animals that do this, clams and shrimps, sea urchins, many kinds of worms. How quickly do these animals get to work on a freshly deposited layer of sediment? Well, it turns out that they get to work extremely fast. Uh, experiments have been done in the laboratory where you have these animals in tanks and uh, it's been shown that animals in population densities of 10,000 animals per square meter can completely homogenize a sedimentary layer to a depth of 10 centimeters in one hour. Now when I say completely homogenize I mean they completely churn the sediment up so that there is no original structure left in the sediment at all to a depth of 10 centimetres in one hour. Now you may be thinking, 10,000 animals, that sounds a lot of animals. You know, in the shallow oceans, their population densities are often 40, 50, 60,000 animals per square metre. This is actually a very conservative estimate. And in fact, um, the destruction of these sedimentary layers is rapid, even when the population numbers are much lower, as you can see from some of the other studies that I've mentioned here in this slide. So, given how quickly these animals get to work in the modern ocean, we would expect when we look at ancient sedimentary rock layers that are supposed to be separated by innumerable time gaps of almost all durations, we would expect to see every single sedimentary layer completely homogenized by burrowing animals. And in fact, this is what one expert, Richard Bromley, actually says in his textbook on trace fossils. He says 100% bioturbation of the substrate, the sediment, is the natural end product of the activity of the endobenthos, these burrowing animals. Notice what he says. Failure to reach 100% or the failure of that state to be preserved in the rock record are conditions that require explanation. Okay, so what he's saying is, if we find any sedimentary rock layer in the Earth's rock record that is not 100% bioturbated, we've got to come up with an explanation because this is what is the norm in the modern world. This is what we should expect. Question, what do we actually see when we look at the Earth's ancient rock record? Well, in order to answer this question, geologists Leonard Brand and Art Chadwick have been conducting uh, a survey of bioturbation throughout the rock record of Utah and Western Colorado on the Colorado Plateau, an area uh, where much of the Earth's sedimentary rock record is extremely well exposed. What they've been doing is carefully working their way through literally thousands of metres of sedimentary rock strata and looking layer by layer, literally layer by layer, to assess the amount, the intensity of bioturbation in those successive rock layers. And uh, you can... Um, measure it using a, a scale. This is the scale they used uh, going from one, which means no bioturbation, no burrows, or at least no burrows that seriously disrupt the sedimentary layers, right through to level four, which is complete homogenization, where all of the sedimentary structure uh, that was originally in the rock has been destroyed. So what did they find as they went, as they worked their way through from the Cambrian right up to the Eocene, as they worked through the uh, rock record, what did they find? Well, here is um, one of their rock sections. This is a 500 metre thick section of the Triassic Moenkopi Formation in southwestern Utah. And the little um, brown squiggles, these, these brown symbols, represent 
um, layers in which burrows were found. So burrows were found in those two horizons there. But even in those layers where burrows were found, uh, the burrows didn't uh, significantly disrupt the sedimentary layering. So in fact, the whole section was ranked level one. There were no animal burrows in any of the rest of the section. So the whole thing, the whole 500 meters was ranked level one. And what they found is that this amount of bioturbation was average for all of the sections that they surveyed. I'll show you the section that had the most bioturbation. This was the one that had more bioturbation than any other. This is a 50 uh, or 60 meter section of the uh, Cretaceous Mancos Shale in central Utah. And uh, what you'll notice is that there are uh, more horizons in this case that have uh, evidence of burrowing but in fact even in most cases here uh, the burrows were not enough to disrupt the sedimentary layering. There were a few horizons where um, there was enough burrowing that they actually ranked it as level three and there were uh, a, a one horizon here, uh, I, don't, I think that's the only one, uh, that was actually um, completely homogenized, so that was ranked as level four. And that was the section that had the most biturbation of any of the sections that they looked at throughout the entire geological record. So, here's another conundrum for the geological time scale. Given what we know about how quickly these burrowing animals can destroy sedimentary layering, it is almost impossible to imagine any sedimentary layer on the floor of the shallow ocean lasting intact for even a few years, let alone hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And yet when we actually look at the Earth's sedimentary rock record, most rock layers show very few signs, if any, of disruption by burrowing animals. Even when we find the fossils of animals that could have burrowed in those layers, in those layers. Okay, so sometimes the animals are there, but the, the burrows are not. So how do we explain this? Well, the best explanation seems to be that these sediments were deposited rapidly, not only individual layers being deposited rapidly, but then successive layers being deposited rapidly, so that there was not the extended time that we, that's needed, even, even a matter of you know, days, for those animals to get to work and to bioturbate those layers. So let me sum up. Uh, I'll try and summarise the argument for you. I think that the old earth model fails to explain these major features of the earth's sedimentary rock record. Radiometric dates suggest that the earth's sedimentary rock record accumulated over a time span of hundreds of millions of years. But if those radiometric dates are correct, there is not enough sediment in any local rock column assuming that depositional rates in the past were similar to those in the present, which I think is what most geologists assume. This conundrum can only be resolved within the old earth model by assuming that the rock record is the product of occasional episodes of sedimentation interspersed with periods of inactivity or erosion of almost every duration from seconds right through to hundreds of millions of years. However, in many places where we would expect to see evidence of the passage of time, there is no physical evidence of the erosion that we'd expect, even where time gaps of millions of years are thought to separate consecutive rock formations. Moreover, extended time gaps would, would provide abundant opportunities for burrowing animals to destroy sedimentary layering, and yet a careful layer-by-layer -layer survey of the rock record shows that the predicted levels of bioturbation are simply not observed and that sedimentary layering and internal structures in sediments are generally well preserved. And thank goodness for it because most sedimentologists couldn't actually do their work if all of the structure in the sediment was destroyed. That, that's what they study. 
So, so we're actually very grateful for that. Now, by contrast, I think the young Earth model actually explains the data that we've looked at quite well. In the young Earth model, most of the fossil-bearing sedimentary rocks accumulated in a year-long catastrophe, Noah's flood and its aftermath, not over a time span of hundreds of millions of years. During the flood, sedimentation rates would have been extremely high, and this would explain the observed thickness of sedimentary rocks, with no need to invoke time gaps except where we have definite evidence. During the flood, Deposition was mostly too rapid for burrowing animals to homogenise the sediments, unlike in the present day when homogenisation of sediments is the norm. Uh, we do find horizons with burrows throughout the geological record, but the amount of activity is consistent with only short periods of time. And so I conclude from this that the young earth model actually offers a plausible explanation of the Earth's sedimentary rock record and that it deserves to be considered seriously and a corollary of that is that we need to look for alternative explanations of radiometric dates. There must be some other explanation because those dates are giving us an outline of Earth history that is actually inconsistent with the physical observational evidence in the rock record. Uh, if you'd like to read more about some of the work uh, that I've cited, particularly the work of Brandon Chadwick on uh, bioturbation in sediments, uh, they've written an excellent textbook. Uh, it's called Faith, Reason and Earth History, and I highly recommend this. It, it really is very well worth um, spending your time studying this book. Um, and the good news is that you don't have to buy an expensive hard copy like this. Uh, there is a free e-copy uh, available online that you can download uh, to I think it's in PDF and you can read it on a Kindle um, if you go to that web address is genesishistory.com forward slash faith reason earth history with hyphens uh, you will be able to download a copy of that book and of course there's Don de Young's book on radiometric dating uh, just as I close let me just mention one other resource that you might be interested in um, about a year and a half ago, um, Dr. Todd Wood and I um, began to do a regular um, podcast. Uh, we put out episodes every fortnight. Um, sometimes it's Todd and I having a conversation about a particular creation topic. Uh, often we have guests on, uh, including scientists who come to talk to us about their particular research or disciplines. And you can check us out on YouTube. We're also on all of the major podcast streaming platforms. So check out Let's Talk Creation, and uh, there are Biblical Creation Trust contacts if you'd like to get in touch with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>